So it is now my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Nia Heard garris who will be leading a session on centering health equity for adolescents. Dr. Nia Heard garris is a pediatrician and physician investigator at the Robert and Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago and in the Department of Pediatrics at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. She examines the influence of social adversities experienced in childhood and subsequent child and adolescent health. Dr. Heard garris is also interested in the factors that contribute to a child's ability to thrive despite these experiences. Her work is federally funded by the National Heart and Blood Institute and investigates adolescent cardiometabolic cardio health, got the right word, as well as approaches to empowerment and resilience. She believes in using research to better inform clinical practice and policy that supports children, their families, and their communities. Dr. Heard garris proudly serves in the inaugural Associate Edit Editor for Health Equity Research for the Journal of Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics. Dr. Heard garris is also an active member of the American Academy of Pediatrics and serves as the chair and founding member of the section of Minority Health, Equity, and Inclusion. Dr. Heard garris completed a prestigious Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Clinical Scholars Fellowship at the University of Michigan. She earned her Master's of Science in Health and Healthcare Research. She received her Doctor of Medicine from Howard University College of Medicine and her Bachelor's of Science in Biology at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Heard garris her husband and nine-year-old son live in Chicago, and as new Chicagoans, they better understand the phrase, winter is coming. We feel your pain, Dr. Heard garris that's for sure. Welcome. We've got you. Thank you. Like that. Great. Thank you so much for um, that introduction. A lot of big fancy words just to say that I really care about kids and specifically adolescents. Um, I pretend to be an adolescent medicine doctor. It's not true, but uh, I have adolescents at my heart all the time. So thanks for having me. I love this like gif of uh, uh, Beyonce and, and her dancers uh, to get information because I really think the whole world needs to get information and get behind adolescents and their health and their healthcare needs. So I have some disclosures, but already um, said some of them. I have funding federally. I also own a uh, racial equity company, a uh, consulting company and the co-author of some text and up-to-date, which I won't be discussing. So I know we had our land acknowledgement earlier this morning. I'm living in Chicago. And so I also wanna acknowledge where I sit, play, do my work in the, um, in the Chicago land area. And so the peoples that have settled that land and really um, occupied that land way, way before me and my family got here. So that's the Ojibwe peoples, um, the Ottawa people and the Potawatomi peoples and many others. Um, Chicago is home to like one of the largest urban American Indian um, populations in the US. And we really fail to recognize that. So I just wanna give thanks and acknowledgement for the peoples that came before me. So by the end of the talk, I hope that we lay the foundation, that we define and explain the concept of health equity. We discuss how racism serves as the central crux of that problem um, in achieving health equity and get information, as I've said, to suggest how to center health equity in adolescent care. So, so a lot of us have seen this slide before, the ideal state uh, versus reality. So many of us have seen it on the far left, you see reality, um, which is uh, a person on multiple, multiple, multiple blocks um, with it, their advantage being able to see the game, one person on a smaller block and one actually below, um, below the ground. And then equality is everyone having those same um, size blocks. And then equity is giving people exactly what they need. And then liberation is removing that fence so people can see the game and not needing to even have the blocks at all. 
But because we're talking about adolescents, we're talking about youth, I wanted to um, center this conversation in the graphic with uh, youth. So I like this graphic that I hadn't seen before. And this is showing inequality or inequity, really. So the kid on the left is receiving an apple without needing to do much. It's like coming right down into their hands. And the, right, the kid on the right is confused, like, OK, where's my apple? When is it coming? So that's inequality or inequity. And equality um, is giving people exactly the same, same thing, even though their needs might be different. So in this picture, you see the, the, the two youth. One is on the left, has a ladder, and now can reach literally almost all of the apples. And the one on the right, still confused, has the same ladder, but still cannot reach the apples. And then here is equity. So now the kid on the left um, has a ladder that still allows them to reach the apples. And the kid on the right has a taller ladder to be able to reach the, the apple that they have in their hands. Now this is justice. This is my favorite picture. Um, because if you didn't notice before, you'll notice it now, the tree was bent. And so now there are like stilts and um, uh, wooden boards to help keep that tree upright. And the kid on the left had noticeably more apples, had more opportunities, if you will, to get those apples. The kid on the right, while they had the ladder, there were only two apples on their side. So being able to change that tree and make it more upright, you, you create the opportunities that both kids can actually get to those apples. So it stands straight up, um, and that's, that's where we work. That's what we're trying to get to. That's our ideal state, is to justice and liberation. So I start in um, definitions because people tend to come to this work in different spaces. And I don't know what everybody means when they talk about health disparities. So this is the definition from the CDC. Health disparities are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or in opportunities to achieve optimal health experienced by socially disadvantaged, marginalized, historically, and I wrote currently, um, oppressed groups and communities. So that's adapted. So under that definition, you'll see these lines, and it's to simulate a track, and the track is on the left. So you typically, when people typically talk about disparities, they talk about black versus white, so that's the B um, versus W, Latinx versus white, disadvantaged versus advantage, um, women versus men, or girls versus boys, gay versus straight, and it's always comparing two or multiple groups. And there's always a um, standard or reference group that people tend to compare as the norm. And typically, as we've been talking about today, it's white, cis, heter you know, hetero people. And when we think about health equity, another definition here, health equity is achieved when every person has the opportunity to attain their full health potential. And no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of their social position or other socially determined circumstance. So again, these same groups can still live and exist Right, but there's no there's no difference in between them. There's no opposition. There's no bent tree. There's no a ladder that is multiple multiple um, feet up from the sky because they have disadvantage. It's actually removing all those barriers so that everyone can thrive um, in in spite of and in service of their identities. So we often talk about social determinants of health or influencers of health. I, I don't like to think that things are deterministic of health, but perhaps heavily influence health. So I'll say like social influencers of health. Um, so such as education, healthcare, environment, the social context, economic stability, and, and many other things. ACEs is, a, is part of this milieu, if you will, and it's something that I've been studying for a while. Um, but ACEs are adverse childhood experiences, and I'll talk about a little bit more, but um, if people are unaware of this term, I'll just give you some context. ACEs is, is the name of a study, really, that took place in the 90s. And it was conducted by Dr. Vincent Folletti, a study author, and found that certain experiences in childhood were common. Dr. Folletti did a study of like 17,000 patients in uh, Southern California, mostly white people, usually white men, not all, but it was heavily skewed. Um, and he found that certain experiences were common. These experiences can be classified into three broad groups. It's abuse and neglect. I don't like the word household dysfunction. This is how he categorizes it. But it's household circumstances or household um, conditions, if you will. Um, abuse, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. Neglect, 
physical and emotional neglect. And with household conditions or circumstances, you have a household member living with a mental illness or incarcerated relatives, mothers or witnessing domestic violence, physical violence in the home, substance abuse, and divorce or separation. And so these ACEs are added together to produce a score. So if any of these things have happened, you get a score. So it's not about the frequency, but really just has it happened or not. So for example, I already have an ACE of one because my mom and dad were divorced. So it doesn't say how often these experiences have happened to our youth, but just that it's happened or not. So the initial ACEs, as I mentioned, Dr. Folletti did this study with 17,000 patients, mostly white, mostly suburban. And so there was an, um, an understanding that this may not capture the full experiences of urban uh, minoritized youth. And so Dr. Roy Wade in, at CHOP in Philadelphia helped to expand our thinking on what ACEs and adversity um, really was and who was affected by this. So people, um, he uh, expanded this to include discrimination as an expanded ACE, economic hardship, and negative life events, parental psychopathology, bullying, and community violence, right? So all of these um, are not exhaustive of everything that a youth or um, a young person might experience, but it tried to expand our thinking of what adversity is. So why do we care? We care about ACEs because they impact the individual, the individual person, but they also impact the larger community. When you think about ACEs on an individual level, people talk about the brain and the, the brain's architecture and inflammation and that cardiometabolic thing that I do, right? Um, but as a community, there's community level ACEs. And we think about how communities have been affected by adversity and how communities have been dis made to be disadvantaged. So specifically when we talk about ACEs on health, there are direct and indirect influences on health. So that's health behaviors, health conditions, and healthcare use. So all of these together impact health and influence health, not determine it, but influence health, health behaviors, health conditions, and healthcare use. So just so that you can understand exactly what I mean, when I say ACEs influence health or impact health, those that are impacted by ACEs are 10 times more likely to use, um, uh, to use or abuse uh, drugs, are seven times more likely to struggle with alcoholism, and are twice as likely to have stroke or heart disease. And finally, one and a half times more likely to have diabetes or cancer. But, we rarely discuss the systems that drive these exposures and disparities and outcomes. So I told you I have an ACE, right? And so if I was sitting in this room, I'd be like, well, damn, thank you. Like, I'm gonna have all of these things or these are, this is my future? No, that is not what we're saying. What we're saying is there are systems that create disadvantage, right? And for, make it so that people are more likely to experience these things if they're exposed to ACEs. But, Hopefully we can end on a, on a pot more positive note. So there are systems that drive these exposures. We rarely talk about ableism, ageism, heterosexism, sexism, transphobia, xenophobia, and I'll talk about racism a little bit more, but racism's on this list too. So specifically ageism, stereotyping prejudice and discrimination based on age. So our society tends to be pro-youth, but it's up to a point. So for older people, we want to say, oh, they're warm, but they're incompetent. Like, oh, aren't they so cute, right? But for, very, for younger people, so our adolescents, the ones that we care about, we're like, you're not old enough to do that. We don't, we don't take what they say seriously. So it's pro-youth, but it's pro-youth up into a point. Um, our, our acknowledgement of older people leads to um, pity instead of true respect that is, has been earned. Sexism. This is negative stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination against women. And there's this bipolar assumption. I know many in this room don't agree with this, but bipolar assumption that women and men are diametrically opposed and um, no femini femininity, femininity 
and masculinity can't occupy the same spaces. So that starts at an early age with how people are socialized and influenced in the media, what little girls do, what little boys do, and how they're, they can't be in the same spaces. Um, so I, I'm so happy to be in this space because I've we've already talked about these these concepts that, that that is there's not a binary here, and then heterosexism and homo homophobia. So stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination just based on sexual orientation. Transphobia. So this is the de degree to which an individual is uncomfortable with or is prejudiced towards a transgender individual. It can be expressed toward any individual who may bend or transgress the heterosexual gender roles. So a, a good example of this is someone who might not identify within that, bi that binary we've created. And so how they experience the world, what opportunities are offered to them, what doors are closed um, in front of them is, is how we think about transphobia. It's not always um, speech, right? It can be opportunities. And then appearance. This is also something I don't hear people talk a lot about. But lookism, lookism, positive stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination given to physically attractive people, who society deems as physically attractive people. So beautiful people are treated better, right? Particularly um, likely to negatively be against those who really violate attractiveness. So if you are on the polar opposite of what society thinks is beautiful, you are going to be treated treat it differently. And I was really happy to see a session. There's a session later today about fat phobia. So weight prejudice, negative stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination against the overweight and obese. So again, those are, those are systems. When we, think of these, when we think of these systems, we're not thinking of the individuals per se. We're thinking about how those systems interact and engage and operate to disadvantage or advantage people. And racism is no different. So when I think of racism, to get everybody on the same page in this room, racism is a system which confers differential access to societal goods, services, and opportunities by race and physical properties. So thus, racism as a system of oppression, whereby the dominant group, generally here in the US, that's white people, exercise power or privilege over those in non-dominant groups. You go in different countries, that dominant group might be a different group. It's not always white-centric. But here in the U.S., we tend to, um, white people have been uh, the dominant group here, and therefore power and privilege has been centralized this, around this particular group. So uh, finally, intersectionality, um, which is where I hope we all move to when we consider all of these systems and how they interact. But it's the interconnected, uh, interconnected nature of social categorization, such as race and class and gender, as they apply to a given uh, individual or group, regarded as creating overlapping or independent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. So I think one of the, the best um, kind of analogies I've heard of this, uh, of thinking about intersectionality, is you know if you go to, if I go to get a job, right, and I don't get the job, it's, it's hard for me to know, look at myself independently and understand, why I didn't get that job? Was it I didn't get the job because I wasn't qualified for the job? Which is definitely a possibility, right? Did I not get the job because I present as a woman, right? Do I, get, do I not get the job because I identify as a black person? I'm visibly a black person. Like, what are the things? And all of these things are interconnected, all of these systems. So sexism, right, racism, like all of these systems are interconnected to advantage or disadvantage groups. So I think we're all on the same page. We understand at least the foundation of what we're talking about today. Racism is a system that I choose to focus on. I want people to focus on whatever system. We, we need a lot of help. To, you saw all the systems <laughs> we're talking about. I focus on racism, but I know that there are other scholars that are focusing on other systems. Racism is really important to me because when we talk about ACEs, when we talk about social determinants of health, to me, this is constantly, it's constantly neglected from the conversation, right? Like there's, we talk about disparities, we talk about black-white differences, we talk about gay-straight differences, but we don't tend to talk about some of these, the systems that gives rise to these, these differences. So, and ACEs are no, no different. Racism is missing from this conversation. This is one of my favorite graphics. If you come to any other talk I do, you'll see this graphic's my favorite. Um, so in my opinion, ACEs, adversity, 
social determinants of health, social influencers of health should never, ever be talked about without a conversation about systems, without a conversation about the drivers of these things. So if you look at the graphic at the very, very bottom, down at the soil, you will see adverse collective historical experiences, right? So this is the Holocaust. This is, these are forced displacements, genocides, slavery, mass incarceration. That is the soil of where this tree, this is an adversity tree, this is the soil which, with, which this tree sits in, right? And the soil nourishes the roots of this adversity tree. The roots are adverse community environments. So that's poverty, that's racism and discrimination, poor and unaffordable housing, lack of educational and economic opportunities, community violence. So a lot of the social determinants, influencers of health that we talk about. Those are the roots of the tree that came from the historical experiences that people experienced as a group together. And the roots then give rise to the leaves and the branches, those aces that I've been talking about. So that's abuse, neglect, substance abuse, uh, parental um, incarceration, education, all, all of those things, right? But we can't talk about the leaves and the branches of the tree without acknowledging the roots, without acknowledging that soil. It's important to consider all of that together. And so for me, racism underlies a lot of what we're talking about. When we talk about slavery, when we talk about Holocaust, when we talk about incarceration, racism is a driver of these um, adversities. So I'm gonna walk you through this conceptual model. It's very academic, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna walk you through it because I think it's important. I think it's important to think about how racism as a system operates and gets under the skin, right? So a lot of times as a black scholar, people say, you know, you cannot be objective to your work because you experience racism as a system, which is a whole other conversation, a whole other talk from another day. But I wanna show you the science behind racism and the science of, uh, behind understanding how health disparities come about, okay? So on the, this first box, there's exposure to racism. A exposure to racial discrimination is what the slide actually says. And that exposure can happen at the macro system or at the micro system. Micro system is where we tend to talk about. That person called me a bad name or I, you know, I saw something um, I saw someone be teased uh, about how, what they look like, how they sound. So that is what we tend to think about, individual level experiences, microsystem. And that the macro system is what we're becoming more conscious about, thankfully, is the media, the schools, the police, and other adults in power, how they perpetuate those systems, how they perpetuate racism within those systems. So exposure happens up here. And then after exposure, you have changes, biological, physiological, so that means in the body, changes that happen after exposure to racism. So that includes decreased self-efficacy, depression, anxiety, hopelessness, perceptions of that society will never be fair, right? But also changes in your allostatic load. So that's your weathering, your ability, your, your body's ability to weather, um, weather the storms, really, and the, and the deterioration of your body's uh, cells, DNA, and so on from those insults. So that's decreased immune function, like how well your body can fight inf infection and illness. Increased cortisol, so that's your stress hormones. Increased blood pressure and increased heart rate. So those things that then get under the skin start to create what we saw with the boxes and with that tree being bent over is these health disparities. So we see differences in birth weight. We see birth, um, differences in behaviors. We see differences in infection. So here in the slide it says HIV, but we clearly have seen that 2020, um, between 2020 and now with COVID-19. So disparities in health, disparities in outcomes, it's not by accident. It was des designed and designed intentionally. So one example of races and aces, ACE that I do and do a lot, we're gonna talk about now. So one in three. A black boy born today has a one in three chance of going to prison in his lifetime. Just sit with that. A Latino boy has a one in six chance and a white boy a one in 17. 
So here's a great uh, graphic from the Prison Policy Initiative that shows on the left the makeup of white, black, Latinx, and Native populations in the U.S. And on the right is their representations, the same populations within the carceral system or the prison population. So here, um, and this is from 2010, so white people made up 64% of the U.S. population, but only 39% of the carceral population. And then here you see Black uh, people made up 13% of the U.S. population, but 40% of the carceral population. Uh, Latinx people made up 16% of the U.S. population and 19% of the carceral population. And our Indigenous and Native populations were 0.9% of the U.S. population and 1% of the carceral system. So I mentioned that incarceration and having incarcerated relative was an ACE, right? So it's something that Dr. Vince Folletti, Vincent Folletti studied and said, you know, this predisposes you for all the negative health conditions that we talked about before. And that is true. But this particular ACE is problematic because of its interaction with racism and the mass incarceration of black and brown youth um, and black and brown families. So in Michigan specifically, I thought since I'm coming back home where I did my master's, I should see how, you know, how we, how we do here in Michigan. I was like, okay, well, maybe better. Maybe it's better. So Michigan has an incarceration rate of 569 per 100,000 people. So that includes prisons, jails, immigration detention, juvenile justice facilities, and so on. Here, same sort of graphic, but specific for Michigan. Here in Michigan, 77% of the population is white, but represents 46% uh, of the carceral population, while 14% is black and represents about almost 50% of the carceral system here in Michigan. Latinx, 4% and 4%, and then our native populations are 1% and 1%. Said in a slightly different way, um, this is the representation by uh, race and ethnicity. So here you see Black people represent 2,169,000 ,000 per 100,000 people here in Michigan, right? It's towering over other, the other populations, so white, Hispanic, or Latinx, American Indian. This is a problem. Wake up. This is a problem. So we can't have a conversation about ACEs and incarcerated individuals without having a conversation about racism and why, without having a conversation about mass incarceration. So how did this happen? It's multifactorial. We don't have enough time to go through it all today. But essentially, exorbitant bail, mandatory minimum sen sentencing, the three strikes laws, the truth in sentencing, the war on drugs, which has changed, um, harsh punishment for nonviolent crimes, problematic probation and parole, the lack of mental health services, longer sentences and more life sentences, and private prisons and profit, um, profit motives. So I often will hear, well, isn't it true that certain groups commit more crimes, right? And so we need to think about how we, how we decide what is a crime, how we keep people behind bars, what access and opportunities people have, right? And actually look at the data. Because when people ask me about um, Black people specifically um, committing crimes and violent crimes, the numbers actually are similar, Black and white specifically. Um, but how those crimes are punished and who gets punished and who's policed and whose communities police are different. And that's where we see the difference. So I'm here in front of a whole bunch of adolescent um, health people, my people, love it. Um, so I wanna ask you, how many youth have had a parent incarcerated, would you guess? And shout out a number. A third? Okay, can you give me numbers in thousands, hundreds, or millions? In the US, 10,000, okay. Anybody else? 200,000. 400,000. Okay, I'll take one more. 500,000. Okay. No, not close. 5 million. Yeah, and the and the news really is bad because this only this only captures uh youth that have had a parent that lived with them go to jail or prison. So we know this is an underestimate. We know this is an underestimate, but this is the best figure we have. 
and it's from 2015. So it's old and we need to update it. And we know that the incarceration rates of women have rise, have risen. So mothers, grandmothers, other caregivers that care for our youth um, are becoming incarcerated much more often. So this is 5 million. So it's not a little bit. And the reason why I got interested in this work is while I was here at Michigan, a colleague asked me, he said, well, when you see a patient, you know, and their parent isn't there, their caregiver isn't there, do you ask why? You know, do you ask why? He said, start asking, you know, and you start asking and you start to hear all of these youth that have parents or their, um, their caregiver, former caregivers incarcerated. And it was shocking to me. And so as we started to do the work, I'm like, whoa, this is a big population of youth. It's a big population of youth that are impacted by incarceration. And why do we care? Again, because Black and Hispanic youth, rural youth, um, and low-income youth are impacted by this. So one in eight poor children, one in nine Black children, and one in 14 children overall experience incarceration. So if you're not asking or you're not aware about the problem, you're missing it. And we know that there's a growing body of literature that says youth that are exposed to parental incarceration, so have a parent incarcerated, are more likely to have asthma, HIV, and mental health conditions. Uh, we did a study in 2018, I think while I was still here at Michigan, and found that young adults that have had a parent incarcerated are more likely to skip medical care. So by the time they grow up, they are not interacting with the healthcare system as much as they did when they were their kids. And they, when they need care, they don't come. They don't come to the, um, the doctor for whatever reason. They miss, uh, more likely to misuse or abuse prescription drugs and have 10 or more lifetime sexual partners. So again, I'm studying incarceration because it's concerning, but it's also intergenerational, right? And so if we have a parent, if we have a youth that has a parent that's incarcerated, the chances of them interacting with systems like the correctional system is, is, is higher. So we wanna think about how do we break these cycles? How do we break these cycles and systems of oppression? So we did another study um, that found that one in every 100 US children have had both, have had a parent exposed or had a parent incarcerated and they themselves been involved with the carceral system in some way. So arrest, probation or incarceration. Um, and this is the like summation of that study that essentially found that non-Hispanic Black people, people that were on public assistance, people from one parent households and urban dwellings were more likely to be impacted by these, um, these carceral systems. And depression, anxiety, and PTSD were more likely to be found in those that have had exposure to the carceral system in, that, in some way. So either their parent being incarcerated or they themselves being incarcerated or interacting with the system. So an equity approach would be to make it so that adolescents impacted by incarceration would have access to both mental and physical health care. A justice approach would be to remove the racism from the carceral system, and others would say that that cannot be done, so dismantle the system entirely. So how, how do we center health equity in adolescent care? How do we center health equity in our thinking about adolescents? Uh, uh, stop sharing, sorry. Yeah, you, we gotta think about it more. <laughs> um, I'm gonna say that this is gonna work, but we should probably double if Zoom can, can someone give me a thumbs up if the Zoom people can still? Perfect, thank you. So in order to, to center health equity and our work, I would just remind us to think about the tree. You know, I think about this tree. This is my favorite tree, my favorite graphic. I tend to be up here at the top with a lot of my research, right? But I think we really need to be thinking about the roots and the soil. We need to be thinking about these collective historical experiences. We need to be thinking about the community environments in which people live, work, and play in order to really impact change and create lasting change. And um, as Kaylee said, I, I study, the reason why I even study ACEs is because I actually am obsessed with resilience. My, my initial questions were actually, how do people, how do teens, how do any of us, they can't see.
Thank you. Wait. Yeah, I was. I can. <laughs> um, but essentially, I'm obsessed with resilience, and I'm trying to understand how do people experience all of these adversities and yet still thrive and yet still flourish. Like, how can we take that and put it in like a bottle? Yeah, that's perfect. And like, give it to everybody. Put it in the water. Like, how do we do that? How do we capture that? What is that? What's the essence of resilience? So I study adversity because I'm actually really obsessed with resilience and trying to understand resilience more deeply. Um, so one of the things that we have studied with respect to resilience has been um, school and how, how are there protective factors that keep kids out of the carceral systems in schools? So GPA, you know, having a higher GPA, having plans for the future, having people that care about them helps them to, to um, not return back into the carceral system, right? So if they're exposed, juvenile exposed. Um, other resilience promoters tend to be at the family level. So attending religious services together, eating meals together, sharing important ideas together helps to promote resilience. But also on the community level, being in communities that have amenities, libraries, parks, sidewalks, being in a safe neighborhood, all help to promote resilience. Having a mentor um, outside of the family that cares about you, that asks, how are you doing? You know, that really wants you to succeed. Those all help to promote resilience. So when we think about resilience, we don't only think about it at the individual level, but again, it goes back to those community levels. How do we create communities, right? That have parks, that have libraries, that have mentors, that have opportunities and have people present, right? To be able to do that. More importantly, what if youth and their families didn't have to continually be resilient? Like, what does that take? What does that look like? How do we do that? How could we be a part of the solution? We focus down there, right? If we really want to create a world in which people don't have to continually be resilient, and continually have to shake off the oppression and continue to step up, we look at the roots and the soil. We fix the roots and the soil. So for medicine specifically, to me, we ask, how is racism operating here? It's Dr. Kamar Jones. How does racism operate here? But that we're not all in medicine. So education, how is it operating here? Child welfare system, how is it operating here? We ask ourselves, whatever system in which we are working, how is it operating here? And then try to fix that. For medicine, it's teaching, research, administration, clinical care, and beyond right? I wrote a, a paper about dismantling racism in pediatrics. So with respect to teaching, it's training the next generation, right? Creating a pipeline, giving people exposure to the field, centering our field on principles of diversity and equity and inclusion. So this conference has been one of my favorite conferences so far because it centers the voices of youth. Like youth are here presenting, youth are here, you know, leading the discussion. That's what it should look like. You know, we create psychologically safe environments within medicine. We need to create actionable systems for reporting, investigating, and rectifying accounts of racism and microaggressions, right? When we're thinking about pipelines, how do we create pipelines? We have to write people letters of recommendation. So that includes making sure that the language is not coded, right? It, it actually talks about people's strengths and their brilliance, right? With respect to research, it's saying and studying racism. This is an, um, a, uh, like a homage to Beyonce, say my name. <laughs> I just laughed at myself. Um, <laughs> and then centering health equity for adolescents in the environment. So health, social and physical environment and structural racism, remembering that structural, structural racism is there at the bottom. Like it drives a lot of the things that we talk about and a lot of other of those systems. Um, I was teaching this course for anti-racism and research. I am sure University of Michigan and all the other educational um, systems here have some sort of anti-racism something. And if not, I will make this available online. Diversifying our research teams, making sure our teams include, engage, and empower those 
that are, that are underrepresented in medicine. Hire, fund, publish, and cite Black scholars. I can't tell you how many people have used my work and don't cite my work and don't cite my name. That's important. Administration. We want to align racial equity work with promotion criteria, like in not only putting it on the, those from underrepresented groups to do this work. We all should be doing this work, and we should align it so, such that people can get promoted for doing racial equity work. And then ensure that EDI, DEI, JEDI, there's a lot of acronyms now, leadership positions are equipped with the budgets, the authority, the status, and influence to actually make a difference. So don't just put a chief you know, diversity officer in an institution and don't give them any staff or budget or time. They won't be able to be effective. And then clinical care, you know, that's really important to a lot of us in this room. Make racial equity a top strategic priority. A lot of us have strategic plans and it doesn't mention equity or doesn't mention racial equity specifically. We have to collect and accurately document patient race and ethnicity. We can't just have people check a box on what they think the patient is. We need to ask people about their identities and language and examine these disparities and act. But we also need to step outside of medicine and step outside of our different systems in which we're working and think about the community. Like I mentioned, that soil and the roots. If there has been community trauma, and a lot of our communities have been traumatized because of what has been done to them or what is being done to them currently, we need to think about what are those systems and how do we, how do we operate? There. So systems of, um, symptoms of community trauma are intergenerational poverty, the long-term unemployment, relocations of businesses and jobs, limited employment and divestment. If you see communities like that, communities in which I come from, you know, we need to think about that, not ACEs on an individual level, but also at a community level. Um, from a place standpoint, it looks like unhealthy and, da un and dangerous, quite frankly, public spaces. Crumbling built environments, unhealthy products such as, you know, uh, alcohol, cigarettes, junk food. Like when, when I grew up, we had a grocery store, but it was a convenience store. There was no fresh fruits or vegetables. That, that's, that's the place. That's community level trauma. And then finally, with the people, it's disconnected and damaged social relationships and social networks. People feeling like they don't have agency and influence to make a difference in their communities. This low sense of collective political efficacy. Well, if I I vote, it doesn't matter anyway, right? It's like, it's, it's being continually told that you don't matter, your people don't matter, right? So how do we fix those relationships? One of the things that's most hopeful to me is activism. What I'm coming to understand and, and recognizing is that a activism actually is a really, really important and constructive means to which we and adolescents actually cope with these systems that are continually pushing us down and oppressing us. There's still a significant am amount of work that needs to be done, but um, activism is an important, an important um, mechanism in which we can, we can operate. So this is a, I'm not gonna go through this huge slide, but this is a, um, a paper that we did to understand how adolescents cope with these systems like racism. And one of the quotes, I'm gonna have to get really close, I'm getting older, to read to you, is it's this adolescent said to us, it's funny because a lot of people think that teenagers are not socially aware. But I think the friends that I keep around me, once we start talking about something, it goes on and on and on. Being in programs that allow you to express yourself and actually talk to other people about how you feel on certain issues, actually, I feel I help everyone get a greater view and perspective on the different minds that we do have and how to accept how other people feel. And so I imagine TAC, I imagine other adolescent groups here help adolescents to do that. And I think adolescents should be doing that work um, but, and should be centered in that work. They should not only you know, be talked about on the stage, but they should be centered. So I'm so happy to be here because they should be centered in leading this work and telling us what they need and help in us pushing out those barriers for them, right? And just because of the work of I do, I can't let them do it alone. I need to be right there with them. I need to be working in advocacy. So advocacy represents actions that promote child and adolescent health and welfare on a population level, distinct from individual patient advocacy. So when I think about my work as a scholar, right, as a person who publishes articles and tries to go after grants, I also want to think about myself as a public intellectual so commentaries and, you know, on the radio is fantastic. But most importantly, 
I want to move to that scholar activist space. I'm going to be right there in the trenches with other people that are dismantling systems. Because my publications, you know, my mom doesn't read them. (laughs) Who else is reading them, right? Like, I actually need to be doing the work. I would argue that we need to be out there doing the work that we say that's important to us, that's important to our kids, that's important to our teens and our adolescents and our future. And for me, it's being involved in some of these um, initiatives in Chicago. For you, I don't know what it looks like, but I know it needs to look like something. I know it needs to do something. So I know that the policy, scholarship, public intellectualism, scholar activism is all needed for societal change. And so I am charged and I'm hoping that you will um, find something to get involved in too. So just to close, health equity will never be obtained until we address and dismantle the systems of oppression present in education, public safety, public health, research, medicine, banking, policy, and other sectors. This will take committed teens, pediatricians, scholar activists, community and policy leaders. I will take questions. Um, I don't know if there's questions on Zoom, but I'm happy to take those questions and any questions in the audience. And I do know she has a new album out. I just didn't have time to edit all the slides. So for individuals who educate in the communities that represent the tree that you have, how would you say that as an educator, you research and how do you empower the adolescents to research and do the groundwork as well? So I want to make sure I understand your question. So is your question is, how do we um, help adolescents and give them like re- give them the education to be able to engage in this work? to even create this foundation ah okay how do we yeah so how do we allow them to get the education to be able to research some of the foundations and stuff here yeah so for me that public intellectual piece is key because a lot of I don't expect that a lot of you know teens like I said even my mom is going to read the articles that I write about this right so I really feel like it's our job to get this word out So however that is, so that's social media, we have like social media accounts that we try to engage teens, engage adolescents. Um, We try to go on the radio, we try to be teens kind of where they are in their spaces and invite teens to come and participate with us. So we have a few that are on my research team um, that always challenge us and help us make the work better, honestly, um, and help us think about things in different ways. Uh, so the, the three that we're, we're working on right now, like one did a whole um, talk about the intersection of fatness and racism, which I thought was amazing. This was really excited about the breakout um, and just empower them and give them the space to be able to, to, to do what it is they want to do and just say like, this is, this is how I understand and operate and influence by the world. How are you? What are you seeing? What keeps you up at night? What makes you angry? Learn more about that. And we can work on that together. That answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Oh, hi. Hello. Okay. Hello. <laughs> um, Is this thing on? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have any tips for teens that may be um, needing some resilience, or I guess in certain ways, just because? Um, I'm first generation college graduate and um, aspiring physician. And so it's really hard looking at all of my friends that have all these resources like you talked about. And I just feel so disconnected from them. They don't have the same struggles as I do. So I'm really trying to find like some resilience within myself. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. You said first generation college. Like, like, do you have any tips? Yeah. But yeah. Have- and f- aspiring physician. Can we just like. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, yes, let's talk after, but also, um, so some of my work is looking at, like I said, I want to burn down the systems and like start over again. That's not going to happen right now. So in the meantime, while people are in the systems, 
um, we are developing, there's this intervention that one of my mentors have, has used um, called CEDARS, which we're adapting and we're going to make available um, via video, like video modules online so that teens can kind of go through them. And every module represents a different skill. So there's a whole bunch of skills that you can have, right, to help with coping and resilience. Um, not all of them are going to work for you. So for example, there is a, a module that we're doing on mindfulness. Some people hate mindfulness and don't ever want to talk about mindfulness, right? But then there's other, um, there's other tools that you could use in this toolbox to help you, right? One of the biggest things that, I, and I'm not first gen, but one of the biggest things that I learned was reaching out for help and finding mentors. I know everyone's like, find a mentor. I know it's not that easy, but reaching out and saying, hey, I'm first gen. I want to be a physician, right? There are so many people that helped us get to where we are in this room that I have, have yet to find a person that won't help someone else. I'm sure they're out there. Thankfully, they don't, I don't know who they are, but reach out and say, hey, this is what I'm hoping to do. Like I've seen your career or like I saw you on this thing. Help me. Right. And people will help. Um, yeah, but we'll talk after. Let's talk after. Other questions? Yes. Oh, hi. So I agree with the dismantling of systems. Yeah. How or what would your approach be to dismantling what we see in the education system? Because definitely, yeah, it needs to be reworked. And definitely, it's definitely not working for our inner city children, yeah. because that's where I've been for the last 35, 40 years. Yeah, my hat's off to educators. Like, the, if the pandemic, if it didn't before, show everyone how important educators are. Being a homeschooling parent, my amazing, beautiful son in the front row, um, was challenging. I don't pretend to know all the solutions in like in all of these systems and how to dismantle all of them or how to at least make them better. So I'm not in education system, for example. But um, I would imagine, especially just given all the disparities that I know that exist. I'm in Chicago now. And, and even be, before I moved to Chicago, like the tracking, Chicago has a, a system in which it immediately, almost immediately tracks kids. Like at five years old, they take a test and they're either in the selective enrollment, the gifted programs, the not gifted, you know, like, so already, right, there's, there's problems there. But so I do know that there's education scholars. Um, Ihioma Aruka, I think, is one of the leading scholars in the space that does anti-racist classrooms and has a lot of work um, and has a book out. I think her book just came out a couple months ago about anti-racism and anti-bias in the classrooms. And I think that's important for educators that are in the classrooms. As far as outside of those classrooms and the systems, you know, encouraging parents to be involved in the, the school board meetings and all of that voting for um, the educators that they would, they actually think are going to align with um, their values, I think is important as well. Um, but just in general, right, like how do we dismantle a system or how do we create a system that actually allows, you know, children to thrive? We got to work together on that. I, I don't know, you know, everything that's going to, um, that's going to help it be that. But what I do know is it's not working currently. And so we might want to take models of where we think are the education's really good or, you know, some models in Canada. I know people have touted and say like, this is really good. Can we try this? Can we model this here in this smaller space or in this smaller city or township or whatever it is and prove that it works, right? And partner with policy people. So people that are being elected or appointed um, in these spaces to help and say, look, it worked over here. Let's try it. Let's get some funding or let's, you know, get some um, public support around this and try this here and model it. Not a perfect answer, but I'm here. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm here ready to learn just as much as you. You're welcome. Another question? Uh, my question is how do you deal with pushing back when you're trying to expand these definitions of ACEs to higher ups, policymakers, or even just yeah. um, people in positions of power that traditionally know that definition of ACEs to only include that limited amount? What do you do and how do you advocate in those spaces to get them to start thinking a little more broad? That's a great question. Um, yeah, so I, at least in medicine, it's been difficult because just like yesterday, we realized that social things impacted health. Oh my God, didn't know. 
Um, so ACEs have been really important because people have gotten gathered around and I tend to framework my, my discussion about ACEs because a lot of people have heard of it. So they root in it. And, um, that's something I can work with. Um, and with ACEs specifically, there's been a lot of advocacy around ACEs, especially when it comes to payment and reimbursement, right? I don't think we're totally there yet, but there are, um, like codes in which payers will pay you if you ask about ACEs, but those are only the traditional ACEs. Those are not the expanded ACEs that I talked about before. And that's when it becomes difficult, right? And so some people would say, well, don't ask about the other ACEs because you're not gonna get paid for that work. Um, and, and I would say we, we, like these ACEs are happening, <laughs> like we would be neglectful to not know from our patients and our families and, the, and our clients and whoever we take care of. Um, but at the same time, we do need to be doing advocacy to broaden those definitions with policymakers, with payers. So that's insurance companies, um, whether that's private or whether that's the, the government, we do need to be doing advocacy in those spaces too, so that people are reimbursed for their time. Like, I don't think that, you know, we should be volunteering. Like, I do think that people should be paid for what they do. Um, and so some of that will come from the, the public sector and, and really advocating with the people that care about health and care about um, insurance. I think that those two kind of go hand in hand. But with regardless of the paying aspect, I think educating people. So when you talk about ACEs, making sure you're talking about the expanded ACEs too, um, so that people are hearing, hearing that and are not so rooted in the original 1997 definition of ACEs and they've heard, oh, oh, I get that. That makes sense intuitively. And there's been, you know, work and science around these expanded ACEs, um, I think will help. So you're welcome. I don't know if you can hear me. Oh, I'm, I'm so, so sorry. sorry. I just have one more question. Yeah. So I saw if you had activism up there and yes. like one of the greatest forms of activism that I know is the the picture that you had there, just marching and really saying what you want to see be done. Yeah. And I also understand that that kind of activism is not always possible every day. And sometimes it's like the little things that we do every day that will also make a difference. So what are some things that you recommend that we continue to do or like we start doing every day as a form of like a small scale activism? I love that question. That's a really good way to end because I didn't show the whole, um, well, we didn't talk about that whole slide, but uh, the slide in which I showed the quotes, they were talking about, so that was one form of activism, right? Like is in the street marching is what people tend to think about, but they were also talking about activism online. And what does that, what does that look like, especially in the age of social media? Um, like, is it activism if I retweet somebody's post about something? And inherently, some people are like, no, that's not really activism. But other people are like, especially if it's something that matters. This was, we did this study when um, there were a certain president in office and there was a lot of negative, you know, things happening. So they did feel like that was activism. Tweeting something about climate change, you know, in, in that space felt, um, felt like activism to them. So I think there are small things. So social media definitely is one way right? But also um, donating money, right? So for people that are doing um, work in the spaces that you like, that's not just the political candidates, that's the grassroots organizations, right? Um, so Black Lives Matter, I'm involved with a lot of um, grassroots organizing um, spaces, community spaces where they're, they're teaching parents, they're teaching teens how to advocate for little stuff. Like we need a stop sign at this intersection, Right. Like, so that's not what people think of as advocacy or activism, if you will. But that absolutely is. We need, you know, our our community can't afford, you know, to pay for these speed light cameras like they're like fifty dollars. We're below we're below the federal poverty line. We can't afford that. So that's activism as well. And just showing up and being your authentic self, especially if you come from a, a, a historically marginalized or currently marginalized group is activism like showing up here today being yourself is also activism and especially in spaces where you're not meant to be. Um, and then finally, I'll just say, making sure you partner with other people, because what I didn't say and often will say is that this work is exhausting, right? And it's not without risk. 
um, risk to yourself personally, how you feel, how you show up. Um, but also, uh, there's risk professionally. And so I never want to act like, you know, you go out in the streets, you do your thing, you post on social media and there's no consequences for that. Um, there are, and I wish that there weren't, I wish I could tell you that this is totally a safe space and everything will be great, but that's not true. So making sure that you have other people to lift you up and other people that are doing the work when you're tired, um, it's just as important.